Good morning, everybody. I am Abby Elizabeth, and this is the Earthen Vessels YouTube channel. This channel is for Christian women, but anyone is welcome to listen. I received an excellent question today. Praise the Lord. And she asked me something that I don't think I've ever addressed specifically in a video. So I do want to address it for everyone today. And that is what to expect from the enemy both before and after being saved from her sin. Now, what can happen when we first hear the word of God and believe it? So we've heard the gospel and we believe it and we desire to be baptized. The enemy is going to come along and try to convince you that what you have heard isn't real, it isn't valid, it isn't true. And there are a few ways that he will do this. One way is he'll accuse you of listening to a cult member because no one else teaches that. They've never heard of it before, so therefore it must be false. And of course, we know as Christians that Jesus Christ told us that the way is narrow and few find it. So just because something isn't popular doesn't mean it's wrong. That's the first thing. Another way that the enemy will come to you is he will accuse you of being an extremist or of being a legalist. So for example, the idea that we have to obey anything that is written in the scripture in the world and the world's religion, the religion of ecumenism, they say that you can't possibly obey God, that overcoming sin is impossible, and that therefore anyone who seeks to be obedient is a legalist and doing something known as adding to the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, which is absurd. Anyone who has read the word of God understands that obedience is how we show our love for God. Jesus Christ said, if ye love me, keep my commandments. So the, the enemy will come to you when you're seeking baptism to, to cause you to doubt that that's the way of salvation. And if he can succeed in that, he can get you all tangled up in arguing with people who do not believe the word of God. And Jesus Christ spoke of this when he gave to his disciples the parable of the seed. Now, I'm not going to read this entire parable for you. I'm going to read you part of the interpretation of it that Jesus Christ gave. So in verse 9 of Luke chapter 8, and may the Lord bless the reading of his word today, we read, and his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they may not understand. They might not understand, pardon me. That hearing they might not understand. You see, there's many people who hear the word of God or see the word of God, they read it or they hear it and they don't believe it. They, they think that it can't possibly be true. And the main reason that people think this is because they choose what is popular. They prefer what is commonly understood as Christian religion, which is not Christian religion. So the concept of going to a church building and sitting in a pew and listening to a religious authority rather than being in relationship with Jesus Christ oneself. So let's read on a little bit. Now, Jesus Christ said in verse 11, Now, this, the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. So the seed that is sown in our hearts is the word of God. And when someone speaks the gospel to you, or you read it in his word, and you desire to enter into the kingdom of God, so you can see, you can behold the kingdom of God. The seed is how we are born again. So the word of God enters into our heart and we desire to follow Jesus Christ and we want to obey the gospel. So the seed is the word of God. And some people, because they prefer what is popular or what they've believed all their lives, don't want to receive the seed. So, so they're not open to it. Now let's read here in verse 12. Now those by the wayside are they that hear then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. So these are this is the condition of people who encounter someone who has believed the word of God and is testifying to them. I heard 
that in order to be saved from my sins, I must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and receive the Holy Ghost. The enemy will send to you people who don't believe the word of God to contend with you. And I'm going to explain a little bit more about this further on. But the first thing I would say about this is that there is no need whatsoever for someone who believes the word of God to try to prove the word of God to someone who refuses to hear it. When people come to you like that, you can recognize that they just do not believe at this point. And there's no point in trying to convince them that what you're about to do is the right thing to do. And verily, if you do try to do that, you will get all tangled up. Because often, often people who are religious are very good at, at convincing you that they know better than, than you do. So they'll say things like, well, our pastor doesn't teach that. And I don't see that in the word of God. And who do you think you are? To, are you holier than thou now? They'll say all kinds of things against you to get you to start arguing with them. And that's a distraction. So before we are baptized in Jesus' name, the, the serpent will come to us in three basic ways. Deception. So deceived people, whether they be people in our personal life or people we see on the internet. Something to cause us to think that maybe what we're about to do is incorrect. The next one is, is um, debate. So getting us to try to prove to other people the way of salvation before we have obeyed the gospel ourselves. And finally, the, the third way that will happen before we are baptized in Jesus' name is doubt. So getting us to question the validity of the word of God. So there are three basic things that the enemy will come against us with, but it can manifest in different ways. So one would be when a family member might say, no one else in our family believes that. Are you saying that, you know, grandpa and grandma are in hell right now because they didn't do this? So they'll come to you with the idea that the people you have loved ended up in hell, and that's emotional manipulation. So because something was not popular and everyone else didn't do it, that somehow you think you have some special understanding. When the reality is, is that when we read the word of God and believe it, it's very clear what it says. Jesus Christ said in, Ma in Mark chapter 16, he said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So that's the words of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said in John chapter 3 and verse 5, Unless a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. People will come to you with many things to try to deny this. I'll say things like that water is amniotic fluid and that taking a breath is, is the Spirit, which is silly because then what's the whole point of the Bible? If everybody's saved by virtue of being born, there would be no point to the Bible. So, verily, we don't want to get involved in these kinds of arguments. The other thing they will come to you with, my sisters, is that, that you're, you're being too extreme or you're in a cult. So you're listening to someone that's not the mainstream. So just as it is that the mainstream media is leading many people into thinking things are true that are not, and they ridicule anyone who speaks something contrary to the government-approved uh, understanding of what is happening in the world today. So it is that religious people will do that very thing. They will say that, that what you're seeing in the Word of God, what you have heard, what you have believed, must be wrong because it's rare. And they will call you an extremist or maybe they'll accuse you of being in a cult. Again, the way that we handle this is we realize that these are people who can't hear the word of God because they prefer what's popular. So Jesus said in verse 12, those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts. So they heard the word of God from you, but the devil came and took it out of their hearts 
lest they should believe and be saved. So belief alone is not enough to save anyone. Jesus Christ said that we must be born of water and of the Spirit, and that he who believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So we understand that the means of salvation is to be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, and that name is Jesus Christ. That's the only name given whereby we must be saved. And that's very simple. It's not hard to understand. But people who want what is popular, what I would say to you is that most of the time why they want what is popular is because they are fond of people or they have loved people who are not saved. So they're fond of the people in their religious building that they attend once a week. They're fond of family members who have passed from this world, who never heard the gospel and never obeyed it. And they don't want to face the fact of the narrow way that few find. You see, the narrow way that Jesus Christ talked about means it. the reason he said it was narrow is because most people won't want it. It's too hard. It's too hard to say, oh, you know, this person that I really loved is not in the kingdom. And that means that they're in hell. You see, most people don't want to face those things. They prefer their family, their friends, their social group at the local church that they attend. And they prefer to think of God in terms that are not written in the scripture, which is basically that the mercy of God means the tolerance of the devil. You see, God is not tolerant of sin. He is merciful to the sinner and he has provided a way by the blood of his only begotten son for people to be delivered from the power of sin. And that means that when we're pardoned in Jesus' name by being baptized, that we are not bound to sin in the same way that we were before. Now, we all live in fallen flesh and we all make mistakes. However, a sinner is someone who has not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the eyes of God, they're condemned. And a saint is someone who's been washed of their sins in Jesus' name and now is walking on the narrow way. Those are the things that can happen before baptism. People who, who try to say, oh, that's silly or that's ridiculous or that's extreme or, or nobody else is saying that, that's not popular. Uh, those are the kinds of things that come before. Afterwards, all of the above... <laughs> that we just mentioned will continue, but there's a few things that will happen afterwards that we want to be careful of. One, distraction. Two, discouragement. Three, despair. And I would say these three things happen in that order. So once we've been baptized in Jesus' name, and maybe we're, let's just say, for example, because this is a pretty common thing, that we don't receive the Holy Ghost immediately. Many people do not receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is manifested by speaking in an unknown tongue until a little bit after they're saved from their sins. Now, that's not the case with any, everybody. Some of us receive the gift of the Holy Ghost before baptism. Some of us receive it at the time when we're baptized, and some of us receive it after. But it's pretty common these days for people to not receive it immediately because they have believed lies about it and that they don't receive it by faith. You see, when we receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, it's not because of our, of our own worthiness. It's because it's a gift from God and it's promised to us. But many people think that things like speaking in tongues is a manifestation of being out of your mind or, or that it's ungodly in some way. Many people have been taught that you don't have to speak in an unknown tongue, that you get the, the um, gift of the Holy Spirit simply by being baptized or by believing or having nice feelings in your heart. But this is not the case. In the time of the new covenant, when people are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins, they re are promised to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So there's a few things associated with this that I want to talk about in terms of distraction, discouragement, and despair. So what can happen is someone who's newly baptized doesn't receive the Holy Ghost right away, 
and they become distracted with trying to figure out how to receive it. And they start looking on the internet and listening to all kinds of things on the internet. Now, I would say that this is not the only kind of distraction that can come up. So just for a moment, let's consider someone has received the gift of the Holy Ghost. They spoke in an unknown tongue, but it happened once and it hasn't happened again. It's been like a week. So they can become distracted thinking, why, why am I not continuing in this? Or they'll hear someone say something like, oh, well, that's really, you know, no, you really didn't receive the Holy Ghost. So these are different ways that we can become distracted. Another way is, is that we become distracted with trying to prove to family members that they need to do what we just did. And this is a, a dangerous distraction. You see, we can't make someone believe. We can convince someone if we hound them enough to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And their sins will be remitted if they do so. Pardon me. They will, their sins will be remitted if they believe the gospel and they obey it. However, if we pushed them to do that before they were really ready, then what will happen is they will not have enough faith to continue. So to continue to try to push our family members to be baptized in Jesus' name as we have done before they truly understand and believe and desire to serve the king and walk on the narrow way, that they'll be baptized, yes, they'll be saved from their sins, but they won't desire to walk on the narrow way. And they'll start falling into what's easy and popular once again. You see, salvation is something that is provided to people so they can enter in to covenant with God. And this means that once you're saved, now you're not of this world, you're of the kingdom and you serve the king. And it's not easy, it's not popular, and people will oppose you. So someone can be convinced that it's wise, it's, the Bible says that we should be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins and receive the Holy Ghost. We can convince people to do that, and, and it doesn't mean they're not saved if we've convinced them and they've done it. But what can happen is, is that, that they didn't count the cost about what it means to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, which means to give up everything, to be willing to crucify one's flesh daily, that if someone isn't hasn't decided that that's what they want to do, what they want is to be saved, they want to avoid hell, but they don't desire to crucify their own life and serve Jesus Christ, then that's unprofitable. It's unprofitable for them and it's unprofitable for us. Rather, as a new Christian, we don't want to be distracted with immediately trying to save our entire family and all of our friends and everybody at the local church before we are strong ourselves. So we can tell people what we have done. Of course, we would. But we don't become distracted with starting to have uh, what is commonly known as a ministry before we are uh, um, strong in the, in the faith ourselves. So, distraction. We can be distracted with many things. Maybe we're baptized in Jesus' name and we feel good for a couple of weeks and we're abiding in the Word of God. And, and maybe you're listening to videos on the Earthen Vessels YouTube channel or uh, the other brethren who are elders in the body of Christ or brothers in the body of Christ. And then YouTube starts suggesting other stuff. And you start getting distracted with things like um, the New World Order or um, what's happening in the U.S. election show or, or uh, um, health issues or, or su such like. That we can be distracted in many ways. And once we become distracted, and this, of course, is what the enemy will do, he'll try to distract you from the Word of God. So we understand in Luke chapter 8, that the seed is the word of God. Now let's read, starting in verse 13. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joys, jo with joy, pardon me. And these have no roots, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation, 
fall away. So someone who has recently obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, heard the word, obeyed the gospel, and desires to serve Jesus Christ, they receive the word with joy. The enemy has a, an interest in distracting you and tempting you and luring you away, tempting you into thinking that, oh no, your family members are going to go to hell if they don't do what you did just right now, this minute. But you see, it doesn't work that way. You see, we understand that it is God who prepares the heart to receive the word. And just because our heart was prepared to receive the word doesn't mean that everyone around us is in that state. We need to be patient with them. We speak the word to them of what we've done, and then we walk with Jesus. We don't try to convince people of what we've done that they need to do it also. That's unprofitable, it's a distraction. Furthermore, we abide in the word of God and we stay close to Jesus Christ knowing that if we don't, we can be lured away by the things of this world. Maybe we want a husband. Maybe we're worried about our housing situation. Maybe the devil's come along and said something like, well, how come you're sick? You must not be saved. So that's the other thing that will happen is the devil discouragement. The devil will try to convince you, well, you're not really saved. You're not really saved. Maybe you haven't received the Holy Ghost yet. Or maybe you did something a long, long time ago, and now he's saying that you committed the unpardonable sin. He'll try to get you discouraged. He'll say, you're sick, so you can't possibly be saved. You're not really healed. You're not good enough. So not saved, not healed, not good enough. Those are the kinds of things that happen when we become distracted. So, you know, I know for a fact that many times in my walk as a Christian, I have been afflicted in my flesh with this kind of sickness or that. And the devil likes to say, uh oh, <laughs> look at you. There must be something wrong with you. And the thing is, sometimes there is something wrong with me. Maybe I've become distracted. Maybe I'm not feeding on the word of God. Or maybe I've started to be consumed with, with what's happening in my unbelieving family members. You see? But the thing is, is that if I've become sick, that doesn't mean I'm not saved. It means that I've become distracted and I'm not focusing on the light. You see, if we want to grow as a Christian, we have to consume the word of God. I want to ask you now to turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So how is it that we deal with all of these things, either before or after baptism? This is how. First of all, we recognize that when we're a baby, we're a lamb. We're not a big ram. We're a lamb. And we need to be fed with milk. So we don't argue with the serpent's theologians. If the serpent's theologians come to us and say, oh, you're adding to the finished work of the cross, or you're a legalist, or, or what have you, that we can just recognize that, that they don't believe, and we can pray for them, and we can simply return to abiding in the pure milk of the world, just like a little baby does. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. So if you have not received the gift of the Holy Ghost, that doesn't mean you're not saved. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. If you haven't been healed of some malady in your flesh, it doesn't mean you're not saved. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. It means that you need the sincere milk of the word. And the, the more that you abide in the word of God, the more you will grow. And the devil wants to distract you from doing that and get you to get involved in other things 
that will cause you then to be discouraged. So we don't want to allow ourselves to be distracted because we know that after that, what will happen is we will be discouraged. And if it continues long enough, we will fall into despair. Distraction, discouragement, despair. So when we become discouraged, it can be like, well, you know, I've been praying for my healing now for two months and I'm still not healed and starting to do research on the internet about, you know, this remedy or that that method or what have you. Starting to do research on the internet about how to receive the Holy Ghost or maybe you don't really need to speak in other tongues or that sort of thing. Distraction, discouragement, and if that continues, we fall into despair. And that's exactly where the enemy wants you. Because when you've been saved from your sins by being baptized in Jesus' name, you are now a threat to him and his kingdom. You have the light. And if you shine that light, you're going to cause him to be destroyed in, in the world around you. And it may not happen immediately, in the hearts of people that you love, but it will happen in your life that the light that shines in you will draw many to the kingdom of God and you will bear fruit for the kingdom. And that's why the enemy wants you to be distracted and discouraged and in despair. So to give up and say something like, well, I guess I just wasn't good enough. I must have sinned the unpardonable sin or something, so now I'm going to go kill myself. And that's exactly what the enemy wants, and that's where all of these things lead. We want to be very careful to not allow this to happen at all. Now let's go back to Luke chapter 8, verse 14. And they, so now we're moving on, and they that fell, which fell among the thorns, are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches, riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. So we've been saved from our sins. We're continuing in the word of God. And then we go forth and we start to be choked with cares. What's going to happen to my family members who are not saved? And riches Oh, I want a husband, I want a house, I want I want a ministry, riches, pride, pride, the pride of life, the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh, distractions of the world. We want to be very careful about this, my sisters. We don't want to start thinking that we have to be some kind of big thing in the kingdom of God. Rather, we want to serve Jesus Christ in humility and grace and recognize that what we need first is the sincere milk of the word. We don't want to start being distracted with the things of this world. And it's good to want a husband. It's good to have a nice home. It's good to be concerned about our unsaved family members. But we have to keep our eyes on what's the most important thing, which is to abide in the word of God. Because the reason God, the Father, sent his only begotten Son to save you was so that you could be in relationship with him. And it is Jesus Christ who saves people. It is Jesus Christ who is our provider, our healer. And so anything that we have need of, even more than what we have needed need of, will be given to us if we seek the kingdom of God first. Jesus said, seek ye first the things of the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. So we seek the things of the kingdom first, and we realize that the people that we love aren't saved by our efforts. They're saved when they hear the word of God and desire to serve the king. That is something that only God can bring about. And we want to bring forth fruit to perfection. And we understand that bringing forth fruit in our lives 
comes forth with patience. So let's read the last verse here in the part that I'm going to cover today. Verse 15, but they, that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it. So you hear the word and you keep it. In other words, it's your treasure. So we desire the sincere milk of the word because we treasure it. We treasure the light and the hope and the joy that it brings, the comfort, the closeness to the living God. We treasure that word. So we hear the word and we keep it. And where do we keep it? We keep it in our heart. And how is it kept in our heart? By reading it and doing what it says daily. Not just hearing it once and getting baptized and then thinking now you're all set and going on with all the distractions and the cares of this life. But they that on the good ground are they, pardon me, but that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. What I would say is if you plant a cherry tree and you put that seed in the ground, that seed is going to bring forth life, but not the next day after you plant it. First, the seed will crack open. Then a little shoot will come up. And then we'll, what will come forth is a, a, a sapling, a little tiny tree. And it will begin to have more and more leaves and grow and grow strong. And then in time with patience, it will bring forth fruit, cherries, cherries. So I'm just going to read this again because this is a very beautiful concept and something we all need to remember. First Peter chapter two and verse two and three. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Glory be to God. I pray that this message has helped the, the young sister who asked me and anyone else who is young in the faith. And may we all desire the sincere milk of the world. I, word. I would say that I, I, I'm uh, kind of an old you at this point, and uh, I still very much desire the sincere milk of the word that I might grow thereby. We all need the word of God. We all need to recognize that Jesus Christ is our Savior, and we need to abide in him, lest we become withered and worn and useless to God. You see, when we abide in Jesus Christ, it means that we abide in his word. We do what he says, and we follow him daily. And we understand that that is the way to the kingdom. Glory be to God. So at any rate, I remain here for you also to help you along the way. If there are things that come up in your walk that are difficult or you need prayer or you just like to talk to me as your sister, I remain here for you. My email is in the description box below. And may the word of the Lord go forth today and edify many. In Jesus' precious name, amen.